Hello, passengers, and welcome aboard the TV Pilot's License with service to Broadway. We ask that you please fasten your headphones, secure your podcasting device, and remember, while they say the lights are neon bright on Broadway, we ask that you please turn off your reading lights during takeoff and landing. Welcome to the TV Pilot's License. My name is Jeff Kerbis. Max, you're here. Where the hell is Rich? He seems to be missing. Oh, there's no casting like podcasting like no <laughs> casting, I know. <laughs> well, Max, I'm glad you're excited because, folks, this week we are talking about, like, sort of this cult hit known as Smash. Uh, if you've never heard about it before, guess what? You can find it on Peacock, you can watch it in its entirety, and you can come back and listen. Or maybe you're just curious, you can listen right now. But, Max... While we're missing Rich, um, it feels appropriate that we maybe bring on some experts who have some very strong opinions uh, about this show. Uh, today's guests are the biggest duo on Broadway. No, it's not Rodgers and Hammerstein, and Kander and Ebb wish they could get a spot on this flight. Please welcome the co-hosts of Drama with Connor and Dylan. Connor and Dylan McDowell. Connor and Dylan, welcome to TV. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Drama. Drama. That's how we (laughs) start every episode of ours. Guys, this is so much fun. I love that introduction. And to be compared to those luminaries, I mean, my God, that's you. For, you forgot to mention Houston and Levitt, who we'll get into quite a bit today. But I, <laughs> I, I do feel like we are also a modern Houston and Levitt. But thank you for having us on on the show. Oh my who God! Can, who can forget the show Heaven Is a Place on Earth? Uh, <laughs> truly, one of the greatest musicals of our time in the NBC universe. Um, well, boys, thank you both so much for joining us, and we're really excited to dive into this show. I'd love for the audience to know a little bit more about your background. Uh, Tell us a little bit about drama. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, drama is a weekly podcast. It's where pop culture and theater sort of intersect. And we've been running since 2019. We just partnered with the iHeartRadio Broadway Network. It's essentially long form conversations that we joke are intimately casual because of the long form sort of setup. We're able to like go beyond you know, your favorite Broadway actors who might be promoting the show that they're currently in or a show they've been in. But then we also get to know about what they're binge watching or what music they're listening to. And the way that we sort of delve into the conversation is through starting with that moment that got them into the arts in the first place. But then the conversation just goes all over the place. And we've had over 250 guests and episodes at this That's point. Amazing. Including it has been two a come true. people from Smash, I know you've had on both Annalie Ashford and Brian Darcy James. Is is there anyone else from today's pilot that you are itching to get out to drama? Oh my God, what a great question. Who haven't we asked? I've just got to say, you know, if they've <laughs> well, been on Smash, they've been asked. I will say this, Deborah Messing is doing a show on Broadway this season. And I said off to Broadway. Dylan, off-Broadway, excuse me. and Because we do both. We do Broadway, yeah. off-Broadway, you know, all over. And I was like, Dylan, is it, do we ask Deb? Do we ask Deb? And he... He said, you know, she's quite controversial, Connor. I don't know. I don't know if we can. But uh, because, you know, she likes to, for lack of better expression, run her mouth quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But she did just once cut me in line at an opening night party for a Broadway (laughs) play. And I let her do it. Her and Andrew Rannells were hand in hand at the Parisian Woman's opening night, which stars, which starred a smash special guest star uma thurman which she comes in later i don't want to i don't want to give too many things away i mean i don't know if you guys have watched Um, all the smash we'll get into it i will say we would love christian borrell we did ask for him before and we asked we might we're trying to get him on this season he's in um the tammy faye musical so Mm -hmm. and of course megan hilty has been a dream guest for years (sighs) um we're we're hopeful that'll happen because both christian and megan are going to be on broadway this season not in smash which is coming to broadway this spring yes correct we'll get in i'm sure we'll get into that Mm -hmm. Uh, oh absolutely and i I just i totally relate to this we've been playing this game of cat and mouse for like a year and a half with angelica houston she really wants to talk about entourage with us but we can't find the time (laughs) i mean the icon when she entered i mean well yeah we'll we'll talk about we'll get to it (laughs) wow she'd be a dream yeah i mean we had brian darcy james and annalee asher which i love that you you caught the cameo there's so many amazing broadway cameos in this episode alone well 
Boys, I know we're super excited uh, to talk about this show because, um, you know, Max, it's no surprise. I have watched a lot of Smash as I have with most of the shows that we do on this uh, podcast. But Max, for the folks who might be joining us for the first time, maybe joining to see Connor and Dylan, what is this podcast all about? Here at TV Pilots License, we break down and analyze the pilot episodes of some of TV's most famous, or in some cases, infamous shows. We learn a little bit more about how these shows came to be and were originally made, if they're effective pilot episodes and making us want to watch more, and if we think they can be made today. Go back and stream our old episodes from where everyone listen to the podcast. Check us out on YouTube and TikTok to see our smiling faces. And if it is your first time flying with us, then welcome aboard. And normally, this is where I cue in Rich for the question of the week, but it appears that Rich has left us a little bit of a voicemail to go on with today. Hey, co-pilots, both old and new. I wanted to know, since uh, I was banished from this episode for not being obsessed with musical theater, (laughs) I'd love to know, what is the musical production that you did at your high school or college that you would love to see a dramatic story based on? Let's say, like, conflict between the cast, things like that. Um, yeah, let me know. I'm, I'm excited to hear. Wow, I was so soothed by Rich's voice just now. It, I, it, I isn't it nice? Isn't it? it that's, that's why I do this podcast. It's just to hear Rich talk for 90 <laughs> minutes every week. Has well, he ever not appeared on an episode? I just want to know if this is a historic <laughs> moment. <laughs> um, I have to look back. It might have only been one episode that he hasn't appeared on before this moment. But Rich, thank you so much for the voicemail. We miss you on this episode. But let's talk a little bit about your question of the week in honor of you and that is what is that musical or theater production that you want that dramatic retelling of the behind the scenes and i am here to talk about my high school's production of funny girl yes uh when we did funny girl in my high school there was a person that thought of themselves and almost When I watched Glee, I was like, oh, my God, we had a Rachel Berry. Of course, every high school has a Rachel Berry-esque human being. And there was everything. There was the Rachel Berry-esque person. There were disputes amongst the cast. There was a what I can only describe as a very troubling thing that happened with a broomstick. And that is all I am going to say NBC, call me. I want a 20 episode minimum and we can do at least two seasons and I'll have a great time. <laughs> now, it was your Fanny Bryce this girl who thought she was Rachel Berry? Oh, 100%. We, we had one of those high schools where like, it reminds me almost of like a football coach who bases their offense off of like that, that one fast guy. So they run like the wing T offense and they're just like, oh yeah, he just gets the ball and runs. Our high school musical producer was just like, oh, yeah, we have one talented girl who just is like a problem. We're going to do funny girl. Like, I feel like a lot of high schools are like that as well. Oh, yeah. You're appealing to the bisexuals today by going into a full football sort of <laughs> reference here this, on a podcast primarily about Broadway. I have to respect it. The, this tracks with the um, one a couple weeks ago, Max, what was it? We are... Um, our spouses slash our partners cast us as different female pop icons and said I was Sabrina Carpenter because I was the most hetero of the group, which I took as very offensive. So, I mean... <laughs> Max, I'm curious, um, what are you thinking for your high school? So I'm I'm not going to do a show that was at my high school directly, but a high school musical theater experience I had where I got to do a basically one time and never seen again attempt from MTI Music Theater International to turn Andrew Lippa's The Wild Party into a student edition, which is one of the most like provocative, sexually charged drug fueled musicals of the late nineties. And they said, we're going to make this appropriate for high schools to do. And it, it was not appropriate for high schools to do. Uh, but I got to do this production with so many like Broadway and pop culture icons, uh, people like, uh, Nick Christopher from Sweetie Todd, who was involved with this, uh, the iconic Natalie Walker was involved in this and just being a part of all of these like 
teed theater powerhouses if you're of that bubble doing the most like provocative sexually charged stuff as like 15 and 16 year olds that should never have seen the light of day let alone our parents seen us do it <laughs> oh my god that is incredible and those are some absolute icon they're working to this day so connor and dylan um choice is yours what are you thinking as far as this dramatic retelling I'm sure we have the same answer. You know, as we're twins, we did go to the same high school. And sure. our senior year, we, we, yeah, we decided to, I was going to make a parent trap reference, but I decided I opted against it. But we, Dylan and I, and a friend of ours decided to do a student run, directed, produced, everything version of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. We like did it outside of the music department's theater season and we did it all ourselves we had a few adult helpers who kind of joined in but the whole band the whole crew front of house cast everything was student run um we did it for charity technically yeah and um it was so dramatic though oh my god dylan and i were director choreographers and we also you know acted in it as well and it was absolutely absurd and it was while glee was airing so i feel like we were maybe like inspired by them to be like bold and brassy and you know just <laughs> the reason it, it was dramatic is people just couldn't grasp that we would do something outside of like the parameters of what the high school was already offering and it was very much rocking the boat like we had parents in the music department telling us we needed to shut it down oh my the, gosh but i will say the the choir director slash drama teacher at the high school who put on the musical and whatnot was their opening night was the one of the first on her feet to give us a standing ovation at the oh. end of the first thing so it did have a nice happy ending in that regard but there was a lot of drama throughout when we're talking about edgy theater, we're trying to get shut down. We're, we're talking about the same Joseph here, right? We're not talking about a different <laughs> Joseph. <laughs> yeah, with a children's chorus and everything. I mean, it was, yeah. I will give a different example just because, Connor, that was a great one. But we did do a crazy production of Into the Woods, which, you know, it had showmances backstage and a lot Ooh. of, like, cast infighting. I got in huge trouble during the final performance for ad-libbing and calling Little Red Busty Red instead of Little Red during the final. I look back and I'm like, why did I do that? Like, why did I think that was okay? Like, yeah, I got reamed during intermission by the director. Rightfully so. I look back and I'm like, that was very immature of me, but whatever. I I absolutely love it. And I think they're both (laughs) fantastic and enlightening examples from uh, the two of you. Uh, Well, thank you, Rich, if you're listening to this, which I sure I am sure you are uh, for that that question. Let's talk a little bit more about Smash before we do so. A quick synopsis. More drama occurs behind the scenes than on stage as the team prepares an ambitious Broadway musical on the life of Marilyn Monroe. Very much centered on the first season and on the first episode of Smash. But Max, can you tell us a little bit more about how the show got made? Today, we are talking about the pilot of Smash, which originally aired on February 6, 2012 on NBC. And we're talking about the show's creator, Teresa Rebeck, a little bit. Uh, Teresa Rebeck is a Pulitzer Prize finalist, Emmy nominee, and Razzie Award winner. On TV, she's best known for her work on NYPD Blue and Law & Order Criminal Intent, while her film credits include Harriet the Spy and Catwoman, her Razzie win, along with one of my favorite weird action movies in the past five years, The 355. Production and conception of Smash begins back in 2009 with Steven Spielberg developing an anthology series at Showtime where each season would follow the workshopping and production of a new fictitious musical. If any of them were deemed stage-worthy, Spielberg would go on to produce them and finance them as an actual full-fledged Broadway musical. Spielberg brings on Rebeck to pen the script after seeing her play The Understudy and at the recommendation of Oscar-winning producers Craig Zayden and Neil Marin, known for Footloose, Chicago, Hairspray, and so many more musical productions on TV and film. The series shifts networks moving to NBC after Showtime's president Robert Greenblatt became the new chairman of the network and simply took the idea with him. Both Deborah Messing and Catherine McPhee noted the original Showtime script had a lot more nudity and was definitely conceived (laughs) as a cable show. Immediately, a pilot is ordered at NBC in January 2011 with a budget of $7.5 million given to producing today's episode. To write the musical within the show, Tony Winters, Mark Shaman, and Scott Whitman are brought onto the project. The duo is best known for the music and lyrics of Hairspray, and in more recent years, the Broadway adaptations of Catch Me If You Can, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and Some Like It Hot. Another Broadway heavy hitter is brought onto the pilot in director Michael Mayer, a Tony winner and four-time nominee for Best Director. 
Mayor One is Tony for his work on Spring Awakening, has been nominated for productions of You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, Thoroughly Modern Millie, and Hedwig and the Angry Inch. NBC went all in on its Broadway drama with a heavy ad campaign during the Super Bowl the week before, featuring the most bizarre four-minute commercial with the stars of all of NBC's shows performing Brotherhood of Man from How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. Uh, It features Alec Baldwin introducing the cast of Smash and welcoming them to NBC's primetime lineup and a singing and mild soft shoot dance from one Donald Trump. So, will you let Smash be your star, or is it curtains on today's pilot on TVPL? Let's dive I, in and find out. <laughs> I, Max, thank you so much for that hit, little bit of history. I just want to say, Max texted me this morning, and he's like, you have to watch this. And it was the full four-minute commercial. And I have never had so many jump scares in my life uh, watching a commercial that appeared during the Super Bowl. But... Let's dive into this pilot a little bit more. And I think that if we're going to give this show one thing, and this pilot specifically preys on one thing, I think it does a great job of the reality of auditioning for something on Broadway um, and showing at Cattle Call, but also reminding us, why is Catherine McPhee on this show? Um, Why is she here and she sings from American Idol, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Connor and Dylan, you look like you have thoughts. I need them all. (laughs) Well, I I clocked the same thing because we all remember she did have iconic performances that she sang a few times on Idol of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And for the show to open on that, too obvious for me. Like, (laughs) I was like, we know, that's that's how we know you, Kat. That's how we know. Actually, Kat McPhee Foster, I should say. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a callback to Idol. And I actually, I did not watch the four-minute promotional trailer that you just described, <laughs> Max, but I don't remember it. Maybe it's for the best, or maybe I blocked it out. But the the trailer for the series did, at the end of it, say, and introducing Catherine McPhee. And I'll remember that moment for the rest of my life. It was a what they thought was going to be an A Star is Born moment. And I think that they were trying to remind mm-hmm. us of... Because she did not win American Idol. She disappeared for a few years there. And then she reappeared on Smash. So, I mean... I remember at the time being so anti Kat McPhee because I was so down for Megan Hilty. Mm -hmm. And I know we'll get into the sort of team team Ivy Karen. Karen. Yeah. The team Mm -hmm. thing was very big and, you know, revisiting this, this will be my fourth time because I am going to fully rewatch smash now with my fiance (laughs) who's never seen it all. This will be my fourth viewing the first time fully through on network, the second and third time with DVDs. Cause you know, for a long time it wasn't Mm -hmm. available to film and then now it's on Peacock. So um, I, I did have fresh eyes with with Ms. McPhee this time around. And I will say she has the voice. I mean, she is absolutely incredible, despite it being sort of a cringy moment, in my opinion. Max, I mean, as someone who frequents auditions, what were your thoughts seeing Catherine McPhee and then uh and then in this instance Megan Hilty both auditioning in very different techniques? So in terms of the audition perspective, it's so evident now that I know the people who produced the film adaptation of Chicago were EPs on this because they do the exact same trick of Roxy Hart from the Chicago film with Mm -hmm. Kat McPhee in this where it's like it's her dream she's a star in her dreams but she's actually a nobody Um, and and it's the exact same gambit and it gets me every time the opening (laughs) of Smash is the sitcom equivalent of when you have a famous stand-up comedian in your show so you just have them recycle their old stand-up material so the audience knows who they are and that's this they just recycle Catherine McPhee's best of from American Idol if she sat on the floor and started doing Black Horse and a Cherry Tree by KT Tunstall it wouldn't have shocked me unforgettable Mm -hmm. moment by the way her other her other iconic song (laughs) so after seeing this audition, after seeing the reality of like trying to get a role on Broadway not being the easiest thing in the world, we take a very quick turn to meet. And what I will say is this show will not tell us who our protagonist is. And that is something that if you like a traditional show, you might not get that from this because we meet Julia Houston and Tom Levitt, Broadway's hottest writing duo. Um, in one of the most gorgeous apartment kitchens I have oh, ever wow. seen in New York City, ever. But they just have that itch that they have to make something, even though they said they're taking a break. Um, 
first of all, what do we think about Deborah messing in this performance? Like it, it very much seems like Deborah, we got something for you. Will and Grace is over. Come back to the Peacock and we want to see you. It's in the NBC family for sure. Mm-hmm. I love Deborah Messing in this role. I have to be honest with you, it was comforting. Her in this giant scarf, which I remember at the time, did it was the cause of a lot of conversation online. Why is this character always wearing scarves? And as you watch season one, she wears them in almost every single episode. She's always wrapping a big scarf around. Mm-hmm. There's a scene at the beginning of season two, not to jump away from the pilot. I think it's <laughs> the first episode of season two. Julia literally takes off a scarf and has a line about like, I'm done with this. And she throws it away and you never see her in one again. It's amazing. Wow. What, what kind of a detail. Remarkable. They listened to the online chatter. Um, but I love them as a duo. I mean, they're, Dylan, who would you say they're supposed to be like? I would say, of... you know, we don't have too many like male, female I was gonna writer, say. songwriting duos. I would say the closest we have is Lynn Aarons and Stephen Flaherty, who wrote Ragtime, um, Once on This Island, the, the recent Anastasia musical on Broadway. Yeah. Like they wrote all of that music in the movie as well. I would say that is the the pairing. I have to say, I love Deborah. I love Christian Borle. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, you're not going to find me putting my um, flag in the sand or whatever it is about straight men playing gay or whatever it is. I think he is absolutely fantastic in this role. And Alleg- allegedly straight, allegedly sure, straight. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> Mar- he's been married to women. I, I guess I'll, I'll go with that angle on it. But I think that they play off each other so well. And you, you can really feel like there's like this sort of lived in history there between the two of them, which I think is great. So, Max, I know you highlighted one line in particular from this scene, and I feel like we need to talk about it. Revivals and movies, why doesn't anyone do new musicals right now? And I, It, I was, it was true start. in 2012. It was true in 2012. It's even more true now. Um, I, I think if, if you also, you know, heard the credits that I said for our composers and the things that they've done since Smash, it's just all movies direct to Broadway. And... You know, it's it's hard to fill a house. It's hard to get people to buy tickets. Tickets are expensive. And unfortunately, they want things that they know going into it. I think this year's Tonys are an example of it, where pretty much everything for Best New Musical was some sort of adaptation of film from the past 25 years. Um, I don't know who was collaborating for Water for Elephants, but all of the circus work was very pretty <laughs> in their performance. Um <laughs> But I, I like that she's a champion for it. This is also uh, a real weird harkening back to how innocent and simple iPod and like iPhone apps were mm-hmm. in 2012. Because she says yes. that her favorite app is a thing where you can blow on your iPad and make Marilyn Monroe's skirt blow up. Which reminds me of a thing I had on my phone that was just called the beer app. Where you could crack an imaginary beer on your phone and then tilt it and the beer would pour out and it's like we we've lost the light we've strayed so far from why the iphone was invented it ultimately makes smash a period piece in many ways the the apple culture around the even headphones you know there's a scene later where megan hilty's wearing these big pink headphones like she'd be wearing airpods today you know it's just so different the way that that the way that things were, we were so bound to the cords in many ways i i think that the one of the great things about this pilot is for people who are super into Broadway, this is what I like to call an oh my God pilot. Of like, oh my God, that's Megan Hilty. Oh my God, there's Deborah Messick. And then like finally, as you previously had as a guest on your podcast, oh my God, there's Brian Darcy James. There's just so many people who are in this show who have... (laughs) you know, some form of attachment to Broadway, which is really nice for the people who are familiar with it. But for maybe the people who aren't, you're like, I sort of recognize that face from somewhere and I'm not sure where. Um, I guess seeing all these faces in one space, how did that make everyone here? I'm thinking about a few different things, but what you said earlier about how the show is not going to tell you who the protagonist is, that hit me like a ton of bricks because you're right. And I think though, setting on this very ambitious concept of, Hey, we're going to show you about how to, how a Broadway show is made from origin and all the pieces that come together. And so I love that there's all these different, very different actors playing very different roles, but they're all very in, in tech, integral, integral roles in what it means to put on a Broadway show. I mean, I work in the theater industry. And so it's interesting to see 
okay, how important the producer is, how much input the director has. I mean, of course, it's all, it all becomes very cockamamie, but the writers, the actors, I love that we have an in from every single direction. Yeah, I just, I, I, I'm sorry, Max, you've gone. Oh, no, 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 go ahead, John. I was just to speak to Jeff's question, like, it was comforting to me to see it as a Broadway fanatic. Like I felt like the show was for me in the sure. same way that Glee felt for many years there of like Broadway cameos left and right. And I think that that was my buy-in in many ways was like, Oh, like I'm obviously, you know, would rather have, would rather have Ivy as Marilyn because I love her and I'm, she was an amazing Glinda and then all these other different things that she's done on Broadway. And so for me, it was great. And I also think it's kind of fun to see like in the last decade, since Smash, like all these people are still working and many of them have gone on to film or I mean, film and television careers. I mean, Brian Darcy James, we mentioned him a few times. He was in the movie Spotlight a few years after this. Oh, yeah. one of the, the core reporters on that. So, and, and they're the guy, the kid who plays their son was the love interest in the Sir Sharon and film Brooklyn. I don't know if you Yeah, saw this that. is like one of Emery Cohen's <laughs> first big things. He was just yeah. in the bike riders last year. He's great oh, in that. Oh, I didn't know he was in that. So I think that as we said, this sort of shows the making of a show. We see it bloom almost from a, an idea from an assistant of like, hey, Marilyn Monroe is this big thing. And I have in my notes, we get to see the birth of an idea, but also is Deborah Messing's character really into baseball? Uh, because she's <laughs> like, we get to do a baseball number almost as if that is like this unspoken like dream of every Broadway writer of all time. Um, what did you guys think of seeing the birth of, it's not called bombshell at this point in time, but the birth of an idea? It's organic. It's fun. It's interesting to see something get conceived in real time. The timeline on Smash is a little bit of a mess. How quickly they have yes. a full like plot synopsis, a full story, multiple songs written, all while Deborah Messing and Brian Darcy James are supposed to have adoption meetings that week. I have no idea how they're getting this done in real time, but it is fun to see the pieces getting workshopped, the inklings of ideas becoming something more and something more and eventually getting to a workshopped number. I did read a fun fact that they talked about one of the ideas they had to scrap from the musical would have been a trio between actors playing JFK, Joe DiMaggio and Arthur Miller, all singing about like what love meant to them from different perspectives. And that would have been perfect. I would have loved to have seen that. I'm sad we'll never get it. Maybe the Broadway version coming to stage soon will bring this number back. I think it could be really pivotal. I'm hoping, fingers crossed. <laughs> I love it. Oh my god. Um, yeah, no, wait, I, I agree. And I, the whole thing just looked very expensive to me. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it it you could tell that every single dollar of that seven point five million was spent. I will say it looked really dark. Did you catch that? Maybe it was the 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 when there was that dream sequence at the beginning into the audition mm -hmm. room, but it. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that was how network TV worked back then. It just looked very, very dark for me. Everything's a little filtered. You're right. Yeah, there's yeah. there's always... Everything has a hint or some different filter. Like, uh, one really great example is the lighting for Karen's home is entirely different than the lighting that we see in, like, an audition room where it's a little bit gray. And, like, there are these various different moods that are set throughout it, like, and I, I know that sounds weird. It's like, yeah, different scenes have different moods, but like they're being very literal of like, you should feel this way because it's gray and gloomy in the audition room. And Derek's apartment should feel like a nightmare sequence because it is a nightmare sequence. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about, we sort of mentioned like, this is getting picked up really fast. One of the reasons is we get catapulted into the limelight by having <laughs> our assistant, um, which is a character that I have so many problems with, but we don't have enough time to record about. Um, <laughs> videotaping a private demo taping session and then sending it to his mom, who I doubt knows how to use fake YouTube, who then publishes it, who then allows for all of Broadway's like writers and reviewers to attach onto it. What the fuck was happening in this scene? <laughs> It was Smash's first indication that we're living in such a surreal fantasy of what 
Broadway is, what the world even is. And I loved the name for the fake YouTube. I didn't write it down, but like I, I was, it, it gave me pause. I, I thought, are you, we allowed to say YouTube on TV or why couldn't they say it? <laughs> it's like What's the equivalent of this like Broadway tabloid Perez Hilton esque figure who could make or break their show? What like what's the equivalent of that? <laughs> so are you talking about Michael Riedel? So he's, he's a real, real person. Oh. oh my god, that's amazing! <laughs> and he real. even makes cameos on the show. I I don't know if it's in this season or the next season, but he even appears. But the way they talk about him, they are so they hold no no punches back. 100%. I can't believe he agreed to come on. They call him like a Nazi. I think. I mean, it's crazy. It, but I would also say. The, it's the whoever reviews your show for the New York Times that really makes or breaks a show. And I can't remember if they get into that as it goes later on, but like Ben Brantley would be a good example mm-hmm. of like, you know, of the who that is. But um, yeah, Michael Riedel is real. And I mm-hmm. didn't know that either until I, you know, <laughs> entered the theater world. And I was like, we can't shit. say YouTube, but we can use Michael Riedel's <laughs> real name. <laughs> I also, I, I personally do love this, the first song that they wrote for this Marilyn musical, Never Give All the Heart, which is, of course, one of Marilyn's essays from her autobiography that mm-hmm. I did read when I was in high school after watching The Pilot of Smash and was like, I don't actually know that much about Marilyn. I want to dive into this. So anyway, she's obsessed with this poem. But for being the song that goes viral, it's it's a bit of a snooze. Uh, I, yeah, I can't. I, oh, my gosh. I was about to say, like, it. <laughs> there, this pilot ends on the song that we all were like screaming singing if we were into this show um but of the song of the three songs that we hear for this musical this is the most boring one um, mm-hmm. we're gonna get into the next song that we hear in a little bit and talk a lot about that um but I think that this then spurs, we talked a little bit about, we see all the angles. We see the side from the actor. We see the side from the writers. We're going to see the side from the director in a little bit, but let's hear the life of a producer who has a bit of a tumultuous personal life that they are dealing with as well with a divorce from their partner and that spurring them to need to find their next big project. No one turns to camera, smolders, and says vindictive. Like Angelica Houston. (laughs) This might be dating this episode of the podcast, but when we say demure, it is Angelica. Absolutely. She is is the definition of it. If you have a different answer, you are wrong. And (laughs) I will take your DMs in my DMs and we can debate there. But right now... This is a wild segue, though, into this like high-level Broadway producer divorce proceeding because we were just at... Uh, a quaint country dinner with Cat McPhee's <laughs> Midwestern mom and dad. We were watching her sing every word by heart to this Broadway YouTube video that somehow she's gotten off book for. And then right, suddenly right. we're at a high rise going through multi million dollar divorce proceedings. And I had no idea how we ended up here so quickly. <laughs> I learned what the word escrow meant for the first time, which I mean, actually, I actually don't even know what it means, but I understand what it means, you know, after seeing that scene. That, that's a life lesson right there. And I'm glad that Smash brought that for you. <laughs> it did. It did. You know, Angelica Houston somehow is demure, yet also a towering presence throughout this, this whole season or series, I should say. And the fact that they got her, I did read that she was the only offer only actor that they got to come on board without having to audition. Like, I think that is, that just speaks to her. I mean, Oscar winner, right? Yeah. 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 And absolutely just amazing. She, she owns the scenes that Mm -hmm. she is in. And also like not only as an actress, but her character as well, which is very, you know, in my few experiences with producers, it is very producer like of, yeah, we're going to do this. I know you might disagree with me, but I have the money and we're going to do it my way or the highway. And pushing our team of writers to partner or give an audition to a troublesome director is where we're led to. Um, Max, we were texting last night. We were. And last night you texted me in only the moment I could assume was when we got our baseball number. Um, And I want you to just say to the audience how you were feeling and maybe just a few words about what you thought of this presentation of a baseball number. I could sum it up in five words for you, Jeff. I love that. Go for it. Peanuts, hot dog, Cracker Jack. (laughs) (laughs) 
Dylan and Connor, I want to let you give your thoughts on one of the most wild, like, batshit scenes I have ever seen on NBC in my entire 33 years on this earth. It's crazy because there's clearly a moment where Ivy is about to jerk off a baseball bat, but they sort of cut away. It's like the way that the camera work is, it's clearly a, it's filmed for television, but it's meant to be performed as a theater piece, right? And so the way that it's all done is crazy. There's a lot happening, I will say, but I I was ready to get on my feet and clap at the end. I thought it was, (laughs) I mean, I find it to be very charming. I don't think tonally it matches anything else that we ultimately see in the bombshell musical as it goes along, but everyone's obsessed with this baseball number, Max, as you mentioned earlier, everyone keeps mentioning it over and over and you could do a baseball number. And so I just keep humming to myself, like, what's that there? It's the pitcher's mound. Have you ever <laughs> seen something so perfectly round? <laughs> <laughs> it's so cheeky. <laughs> like there, there literally is like for the audience, one, if you're going to watch Smash, just watch it for this scene alone. <laughs> like, and then if you are bought in, you are bought in. You're going to, there's nothing that this show is going to do that will offend you ever in the rest of the other episodes. <laughs> but I have two notes specifically. One is um, there's just a guy humping the air in an outfit that I could only say George Steinbrenner is currently rolling around in his grave because <laughs> not because of the sparkles, but because some of the men were not clean shaven. If you're a Yankees fan, you know that rule. Um, and then secondly, if we want a real baseball number, we have to go to the song Look to Your Heart, which was in A Bronx Tale, the musical, a very short lived musical. And I will say that song haunts me because that song has nothing to do with the rest of that song, with the rest of that musical. So this I found is a refreshing replacement for that moment. <laughs> I'm so gagged by this Bronx Tale reference here. <laughs> I, have to I am one of 200 people that saw Bronx Tale. It was me in that performance with everyone else. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, I love it. Do you guys think that Ivy delivers as Marilyn in the national pastime scene? That is such a great question because I, it almost leads us into our next section, the casting of Marilyn, right? And it was a question I was going to actually bring up to the two of you of how different Ivy is versus Karen in how they perform Marilyn or what could be appealing as far as characters. Because I think Ivy is, if you told Chat GPT of like how to perform <laughs> Marilyn Monroe, that is how Ivy is performing it. It's very to the book, technically sound. There's nothing special about the performance. And she is very much like the random actress that dressed in the cattle call. (laughs) Ivy, in this instance. But then you have this Karen person who's a no-name off the street. And sure, Catherine McPhee has a voice that is fantastic and otherworldly. But also at the same time, she's very non-traditional. And I can see why Derek is sort of like, hmm, this causes me pause. I need to learn more about this human being as a whole. Max, what about you? They're both great singers. I'm definitely Team Ivy in this pilot. I think she's the traditional, like, Broadway belter powerhouse that gives more of the Marilyn Monroe thing. Kat McPhee has a great voice. I don't think of it as a traditional Broadway voice. Uh, She sings beautiful by Christina Aguilera for yes. her audition oh, number and does a little dance move that I can only describe as uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus when she does the Elaine in Seinfeld. <laughs> it's kind of like a little like hip, hip hop and thrust. And compared to the choreo that we're getting from Megan Hilty, it's really night and day. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, so, I'm so team Ivy in this pilot. I, I'm curious for the two of you, you... You want to have Megan Hilty on the podcast, but let's oh, put that aside and say you get you don't get in trouble if you pick Kat for this. Um, who is your choice so far? I, I'm Ivy. I'm Team Ivy. I was in 2012. I sort of wasn't when I rewatched in 2018, but I'll get to that later. But now I'm back on board with Team Ivy. I just think she has that va-va-voom, movie star, Marilyn, the great voice. She really nailed it. And it's interesting because as... I mean, Marilyn's grave has been exhumed many times over the years, especially recently. I mean, we've had, even since Smash, there's been other movies, Anna to Armistead and Blonde. 
I'm sure there's other projects I'm forgetting about. And the blonde film certainly was more of what a Karen's Marilyn would be like, like mm-hmm. this softer, timid, broken bird. And um, I just don't think that plays on a stage as well. Sure, maybe in a film, but for Broadway, you got to go with Ivy Lynn. Mm-hmm. And, and I also just don't think that there's... I mean, Broadway fans who are listening can correct me if I'm wrong. The idea of giving the role of this, what's seemingly going to be a multi-million dollar Broadway project that's in development (laughs) to someone who has a light resume, Mm -hmm. you would not see that at all. Like that is truly just, I can't think of an example of someone untested leading a musical in that way. So we have this initial audition and it seems like we have our two potential Norma Jeans or Marilyn's, uh, picked out in we have our ivy and we have our karen and i think that this is the point where i watching this show was like wow we could have gotten rid of this scene and never had it but i think this is a super important scene that we're having showing why karen might have gotten the callback um and Dylan, I'm curious for you, like we see this lovely scene with Karen and her boyfriend um, and they're like studying, quote unquote, um, <laughs> some of Marilyn Monroe's old movies. But then we get this very different scene, this juxtaposition with Derek. And like, what were you feeling watching Derek be a creep? So uncomfortable in a way that I, you know, this was pre Me Too, that this whole Mm-hmm. scene everything happened but obviously like there's these like best kept secrets and whatnot it made me so crawling out of my skin during this scene because she is clearly so naive but also maybe not i don't know there, there, cause she does resist and but it, it was very uncomfortable i hate the Derek character i think that this would have been a completely different show if they would have had a different type of director and would have focused less on i, I don't know though the conflict is obviously necessary um you know, in the Showtime version of this pilot, because you know, it, as as Max mentioned, it was on Showtime originally. There, were, it's been much discussed on people who have then gone on the record years later that Karen does give Derek a blowjob in this scene in that original version of this script. But in this version, she rejects him. I would say, um, and I think that I mean this comes into play later on that she did make a visit to his apartment and whatnot. But it, I think it goes and she goes to show some strong resolve on her part and. I don't know. I I have respect for her in that way that she wasn't willing to just give in, but how realistic would that be? I don't know. I can't speak for it. So Max, what about yourself? Like, how did you feel about this scene being in this pilot? So by no means do we have to have to like hand it to Derek Willis, but Jack Davenport of Pirates of the Caribbean fame, Commodore Norrington, without a doubt, the worst pirate I've ever seen playing skeezy British director is it's just another iconic role in this stable <laughs> of iconic roles. I I do think that there's obviously a trepidatious history of power dynamics between directors and young stars. And it is important to highlight some of the dark CD underbelly of this world. It cannot all be jaunty pop tunes and, you know, great successes for unknown people off the street. We have to show that there is some evil that they're going to have to confront if they want to perhaps make it. But he is a real piece of shit. That entire sequence of his apartment, though, is so clear of this was written for Showtime. Like, between that and Megan Hilty with the baseball bat, like, these were remnants of the Showtime pilot that made it to NBC. Yeah. I agree. So, I need to talk about the moment that I think all left a memorable note. And they say to end a Broadway show with your biggest number. And holy shit, did this pilot end it with its biggest number. Um, I, I cannot even express Max. I was singing at the top of my lungs at 1030 at night in my house this song because I wanted to be the star. Let me be your star. And this is where, for everyone who said they were an I- Team Ivy, I became Team Ivy. Because <laughs> holy shit, Megan Hilty, are you kidding me? Like, just even waving down the cab, I was like, 100% you're Marilyn Monroe. Like, there's no way I'm giving this to Kat McPhee. Are you fucking kidding me? Uh, Max, what about yourself? 
It is insane that for a TV hour for 40 minutes, Smash is one show and then it suddenly becomes a real life musical with people just singing and dancing through the streets of New York. <laughs> the moment where everything comes together, like the tone, the direction, the lighting, the acting for me is when Angelica Houston is walking down the hallway and we hear the past is on the cutting room floor because she's divorced and she's angry <laughs> and she's moving on and that's called directing. <laughs> and I love this scene. This is the scene that sold me on Smash. It's what sold me on Team Ivy. I love it so much. And the fact that it ends on that crescendo, and then if you're watching it on Peacock, you get next episode. It's really hard to click out. <laughs> Honor and Dylan, I, I can only assume you were standing and applauding, even though Megan Hilty was not in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. It's like you saw our texts between each other, but I literally, when I rewatched this last night, texted Dylan that I jumped to my feet was cheering sobbing and applauding at the end of the finale it is i i actually challenge everyone listening to this to try to find a more exciting final three minutes of any tv pilot yeah. ever it is so epic it's been building to this moment the entire time the stakes are there for every single character on screen especially these two girls and that's going to be our you know our feud throughout the season and oh my god it is just beyond. And for it to just, like you said, Max, end on that crescendo, and then that's it. That's the It's a cliffhanger. It's a cliffhanger. Oh, my God. Beyond. Dylan? Yeah, I mean, we, we were sort of just touching upon Karen in Derek's apartment, and when she wow. is, like, mounting him, and then she is, like, not going to happen, or whatever she says. And you hear just the opening chords of Let Me Be Your Star, and which, you know, as someone who is, that has ended up in my Spotify top five, if it would have existed back in 2012, <laughs> so many years beyond, even, to hear those familiar notes, it was like a needle drop that you would only get in like, you know, think, think of an iconic needle dropper movie. It was everything. And then just, I mean, that Eileen Rant moment, Max, it's like he read my mind. It is truly cut together so well where she's walking down that hallway in that moment. But it is so incredible. It, it tells you exactly what the show is going to be. And I think it like finally lets you sort of suspend your disbelief that musical numbers will then happen in real time. In, in a glee maybe type of way that isn't just because up until that point it was within an audition or in that work like the work session that they showed so i mean it's everything and i also remember when it was airing on cable afterwards like and the credits would roll they would replay like those final moments of let me be your star and to be like you can own the music of smash now if you go on itunes or whatever and connor and i would walk i, I know it was gonna kitchen. be itunes <laughs> you were, yeah, yeah well it's been it's been a pervading theme Connor and I would walk around our family home and just sing it at the top of our lungs. I was obviously always Ivy, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. that is our pilot, gentlemen. But before we talk a little bit more about the rest of this show, let's talk about some things that maybe we didn't talk about. Some things that maybe you'd like to give a little bit more shine and things we loved. Um, Connor, what were some things that you loved about this pilot that maybe deserve a little bit more shine? I loved that... Deborah Messing's character, Julia, was obsessed with drinking tea. I think she mentioned it in four or five different scenes. Kind of iconic. I love that there are two different moments within minutes of each other where a character is bending over and the other characters are, like, admiring their, their rear. I thought, okay, it worked once, and then we're, we're doing it again. Oh, my God, interesting. They also were obsessed with the word terrific. You hear the word mm -hmm. terrific a lot in this pilot and i don't think i've heard the word terrific since i watched the smash pilot for the first time so um just a few little quirks and things i noticed that i loved but it's also as a theater fan as someone who works in the industry and who loves theater history seeing what shows were playing when they filmed this like the cab for green days american idiot or whatever's mm -hmm. happening there like so fun for me to see uh captured in time those are other things i loved about the pilot for sure dylan what about yourself I think the only thing we didn't cover was Becky Ann and Dylan Baker as the Cartwright oh, parents. Yeah. And I absolutely loved them. It is so, you know, Connor and I lived in New York. Connor still lives there. Like when our sweet Midwestern parents would come visit, being surprised by the prices on the menu, you know, just the whole lifestyle difference. Like I, we never tried to make it as actors, but I can imagine that's a very common thing of like a, a supportive yet maybe cautiously optimistic dad 
it, it's just so great. And I love that they're a real life couple playing opposite each other. I mean, Connor sees them all the time. They you literally were on the phone me. with me last week and we're like, oh, I see the Bakers right now. Like walking down the street. <laughs> yes, they're amazing. I love them too. Wait, did you guys talk about Karen's boyfriend at all? <laughs> no, and we, we probably, you know what? I can make that a thing I loved because Karen's boyfriend <laughs> loves Karen so much. And I have no idea what his job is because he's not doing it at all. It he works for the mayor. Yeah, but he like, works that, for the that, mayor. That means a lot of different things in New York right now. So, like, what exactly does that mean? Um, I will say an additional thing that I loved about this pilot was this is a show for people who love Broadway. And, like, it is so lovely to find or see something that was built with one specific audience in mind that isn't closed off and saying, like, hey, this is we're gatekeeping this for you it almost opens its arms and say hey this is for the broadway community but we would love to have you join in and like fall in love with this as well and find a passion for it as well and that's really really cool max things that you loved about this two things super fast no one plays concerned midwestern mob like becky ed baker you are so right on that dylan she plays the same role here that she plays as uh Laureen Horvath in Girls, a pilot yes. two yes. months after this one airs, where it's the exact same dinner scene. It's it's the same thing as Dottie Lasso. So he just plays concerned Midwestern mob so great. And then I made fun of it earlier, but Kat McPhee knowing all of the words to the leaked YouTube clip from Bombshell is such an accurate <laughs> representation of theater kids in the YouTube era. It's the same thing as how every single theater kid knew all of the words to the University of Michigan Harry Potter unauthorized unauthorized <laughs> musical. Yes. Like, if, if there are musicals that don't technically exist yet in the ether, theater kids will find them on YouTube and they will learn all the words. Max, how do you know how I am every time Third Reprise puts out a new song and I know the arrangement <laughs> note for note? Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about wait a minute moments, things that caused you pause when watching this pilot. Um, really quickly, I just have to say it. Why wasn't Karen from Oklahoma? You had this, like, softball answer that you could have given, and instead you gave us Iowa? Are you fucking kidding me? That is so upsetting. Make her from Oklahoma. Make every Broadway person say, okay, mm -hmm, and then we're done, and we can move on. What about everyone else? Any things that caused you pause? I did laugh when Ellis, the the I'm not sure what his sexuality is assistant was like, I have macaroni and cheese and what's something else in the oven for you. Like that was so, I was just LOL at that. Like they were both in the oven at the same time. Like what? Stupid. <laughs> it meatloaf maybe? Meatloaf, it's meatloaf and mac and cheese. Yeah. Like what? A hearty Midwestern meal right there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's Max absurd. What about yourself? Why do you have Christian Borel and Brian Darcy James in this show? If you're not going to let them sing, just just <laughs> let them hum a couple of tunes. I Look, if Brian Darcy James is just going to play concerned husband with no discernible qualities or attributes to him, at least let him hum a little bit of a classic rock song or something to show that he's a, you know, a, a, just a supportive middle-aged husband. Let them do something with those skills they have. I mean, I think that is a very good point, Max. Well, we do have one more question. It is an in-flight question. Um, we got a lot of questions for this episode. Um, specifically, um, I, I do want to shout out one of our frequent flyers by the name of Dana, who lives in the uh, lives in the Upper West Side of New York. And Dana specifically asked. How did this show not launch Megan Hilty into insane stardom? And how excited are we about her return to Broadway in Death Becomes Her? So we're going to maneuver that and uh, massage that a little bit. And I am going to ask all of you, cast Megan Hilty in a, a TV show that you currently watch or you would love to see her star in. Oh, that's and an amazing I question. Yeah. will start us, just to give us a little bit of a temperature in the room. <laughs> I want to see Megan Hilty in the newest season of White Lotus. I think that she would be magnificent on that show. Yes, I believe we're going to um, Thailand for this new season of White Lotus. And yes, I do want to see Megan Hilty enjoying, like, 
a ice drink of some form yelling at the waiting staff being a little bit nasty but we're also like yes megan you can be nasty because that is who you were born to be uh dylan what about yourself the first show that comes to mind is my favorite show hacks also in the in the max network here i think she'd be fantastic because there's those entertainment world crossovers and unlike a brian darcy james on something we would get the chance to see her sing and I, i think that Hacks is due for a, a singer comedian moment. Connor, what about yourself? She's so funny. Like, I don't think Smash lets you see how funny Megan Hilty is. She's done broad comedies on stage. Like, she was Glinda and Wicked. She mm-hmm. did Noises Off. And I think she'll be funny in the Death Becomes Her Broadway show. Um, I'm trying to think of a good sitcom she could be in. And the only sitcom that I can think of right now is Abbott Elementary. But I don't know what kind of role I'd put her in. Maybe, um... She- we could just be very on the nose and have her be the music teacher in all yeah, honesty. Incredible. Incredible. Oh my God. She'd be great. Max, what about yourself? Megan Hilty does a lot of voiceover work. I'm looking at her IMDb right now. She stays booked and busy in the world of children's animation. Good God. Um, I've been really enjoying the first four episodes of FX's English teacher. And we, we need to see what the drama department looks like at that high school. And it needs to be run by Megan Hilty. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Dana, for that in-flight question. We'll talk a little bit more about how to submit those at the end of the episode, but let's talk about the legacy and the history of this show. Two seasons and 32 episodes, not to mention a pending Broadway musical. Uh, as far as the ratings go, this show actually did really well at the beginning. Uh, there were 11.4 million people who tuned in for the premiere of the show. And that is with things like Hulu uh, being very abundant and ample in use. Um, after that, first season held around 5.5 million viewers per episode, which is pretty good for the 2013 era. But then it sort of dropped dramatically uh, to 2.2 million towards the end of that second season. Um I also want to give the second season a lot of credit because NBC sort of was like, hey, we're going to renew this. And then they didn't know what to do with it. Um, It had four different time slots, including two of those being on Saturday night, which is just what are you doing, NBC? There's other things to do on Saturday. There was a Wednesday matinee for some reason. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I was going to say Saturday evening. Great to see a Broadway show. But for TV who hurt NBC to do this to this show? Um, as far as CDs, this show has an interesting uh, honor in that it is the only show that we have done that the CD for the show debuted number nine on the Billboard 200 for CDs, which is one for kids who are listening to this who are like, what's a CD? Just stop listening, please. <laughs> but It's amazing that they made a CD for the show. They made a CD for Bombshell, the musical, that was Mm -hmm. just the songs for Bombshell. 22 different songs uh, for Bombshell, the musical, that were shown throughout the entire history of this show. Uh, They also did uh, various songs using one being Megan Hilty and one being Kat McPhee singing the same exact song, which is just really feeding into that mindset. Um, Let's talk about awards, 24 nominations and seven wins, including a primetime Emmy where they beat uh, Dancing with the Stars and So You Think You Can Dance for Outstanding Choreography, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, It also won a Critics' Choice Award uh, for Most Exciting New Series. Uh, But Max, unfortunately, I have to tell just you, no surfboards. On no surfboards for anyone, no Teen Choice Awards. Uh, the show did get a DVD release, as we heard before, and it was actually on syndication for a small period of time. I think this is the smallest number of episodes we've ever seen on syndication. Um, we'd be missing out if we did not talk about the Broadway history of this show, because after the show came on, there was a uh, multiple repeated efforts to get Bombshell the Musical on Broadway, not to mention also trying to get Hit List on Broadway as well, which is the, um, let's just say the Rent adjacent musical that was made and focused on in season two. Uh, but I am here to say, and as we have talked about, 
it looks like Smash the Musical will be coming to Broadway for the 2024-2025 season. And I, for one, cannot wait to be one of more than 200 people that go to see that show. But that is the history of this show. And Rich's Game of the Week is go and listen to your favorite Broadway album. Uh, But as this flight comes to a land, I have two more questions for each of you and one is based off of the pilot and the pilot alone would you continue watching smash dylan maybe you're making a pivot and we're not going for the fourth time uh but then my second question is there's not really much like smash on tv right now nor on any streaming service of any type there are networks and movie producers uh, producers who are avoiding saying that things are musical at uh, musicals as lady gaga once <laughs> said joker do is not a musical they just sing to get their point across so i am asking <laughs> all three of you is there a space in the television and pop culture world for a musical of this type and i'm going to start with connor connor what do you what? think for those two questions 100%. But as I've learned as a theater podcaster, it is more niche than you think. It is much more niche than you think. <laughs> and I think that's the problem that Smash ran into on network television. But 100%, I can't believe there's nothing like it now. No- nothing like Glee either, where we're hearing people sing either original songs or covers of songs that we love. I guess the closest we get would be something like The Voice or you know another show like that. Which The Voice is NBC, isn't it? Yes, it is. We don't even get musical episodes of TV shows anymore. I don't understand why the entertainment industry is so allergic to it. But there is a space for it, and we need to bring it back. Oh, wait, there was a show. Another NBC show. Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. Yes, it is. Yeah. You, you guys should do that wonderful. pilot. Yeah. Oh, don't worry. We'll have you back for it. <laughs> and they covered Girls 5 Eva, which did have music in it, but it was all original. Oh, true. Stuff. True, true, mm-hmm. true. But that's, that show struggles, too. There, There is a space for it. I think audiences would love it, but for whatever reason, it's not profitable for um, networks or streamers to do. But I would, this pilot did make me want to rewatch Smash again. Like I said, those last three minutes are so exciting that it just really, I was amped. Dylan, what about yourself? I'm, I'm all in for round four. I'm so excited. And I think that there is a market for it, but it's very specific. Like we had... Fosse Verdon a couple of years ago on FX. And I would say that's the closest thing we've had to a Broadway series. You guys are smiling. Have you watched it or do you? <laughs> I, I watched, I, I, of course I watched. All the the line series. reading when the doctor tells Michelle Williams that she's <laughs> pregnant is one of my favorite line readings the last 10 years on TV. <laughs> I don't remember it. Oh, she just goes like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> She has this amazing moment where she's like rejecting Fosse in this one. She like does this like hand gesture thing. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. It became like a meme online of the way that she like maneuvered away from him. But move away um, from Fosse Vern. You told me I have a heart out. We can't go down this road right now. <laughs> <laughs> but so I think that if they did a very specific series, probably a historical reenactment, like actually speaking of Michael Riedel, he has an incredible two different books. One of them is called Razzle Dazzle, and the other one is I forget the name of it, but I think that if you. <laughs> adapted something like that like the the great 1982 tony's race between dream girls and nine something like that that would be mm. really interesting for for folks to see and of course put a bunch of celebrities in it make it eight episodes and put it on like you know i guess max if we're ryan, we're, ryan we're max. murphy is allegedly doing a a chorus line show isn't that right sure yeah which that's right. i will watch every single episode yeah. of. max <laughs> what about yourself I'm I'm really going to sell it in a weird way on this. The first like 35 minutes of this pilot, I really wasn't sure. It's it's very convoluted. I didn't know how much I was going to be interested in Cat McPhee's waitressing stories and divorce proceedings. And when it all comes together and it shifts so hard totally, that's when I was sold. It's like, okay, there is something here and it would make me want to watch episode two and just continue on from there. People like shows about musicals. Like Fosse Verdon won all of these Emmys and all these Golden Globes. It was so critically acclaimed. But when you actually have them doing the singing, people get weird about it. But I am always going to advocate for movie musicals and musical TV shows. And I do think that there is space in the like Broadway Twitter community and TikTok now to have something like this be 
a major social phenomenon, kind of like, what was that thing during COVID where everyone was doing sub musical together on TikTok and they were all writing? Yeah, it was the Ratatouille musical. Like people want this. They just don't want to say out loud they want this, but we'll, (laughs) we'll find the audience for it. Yeah. Um, as far as watching more of this, hundred percent, I, I absolutely just need this sort of stuff in my life. But I, Max, I, I sort of equate musicals to tricking a toddler into eating vegetables, and like you can't <laughs> tell someone we're gonna go to a musical. You're gonna like Lin Manuel Miranda. It, people are gonna despise me saying this, but it's okay. Um, hopefully, I don't. I'm not found murdered on the street tomorrow. Um, He has done a great job of making people okay with musicals in the sense of like approaching singing in various different styles based off of all of the different things that he has made. Um, Personally, I think that we, there's a space for a show that focuses on the building, very similar to Smash. Um, But I almost go towards one of my favorite movies of White Christmas, where it is not, we're singing because of how we're feeling all the time. We are singing because this is part of a gigantic bandstand show and we need to rehearse in this instance. And if we just, one out of every 10 numbers happen to be singing to express our feelings, fantastic. Um, But who knows? Maybe, maybe not. The other issue that we don't talk about is very much like Ragtime the Musical. Musicals are very expensive uh, Mm -hmm. to produce, especially for TV. And sometimes that scares a lot of people, um, especially in the age of jukebox musicals, where you're not just paying one person, you're paying a ton of people as well. Well, that is our flight, everyone. And before we go and jet set down the street of Broadway... um, I want to make sure that everyone can find y'all. First of all, Dylan and Connor, thank you so much for joining Max and myself on this episode of TV Pilots License. Where can folks find you if they want to get that Broadway fix or maybe just have more of you in their lives? Oh my God. Well, thank you so much for having us on. This has been a true delight, but we are at the drama podcast on Instagram and Twitter and we're Dylan. What are we on? TikTok? Just at the drama pod. At the drama pod. And you can follow us personally, of course, at Connor McDowell, at Dylan McDowell. We release on all podcast streaming platforms, but we're supposed to tell people now to listen on iHeartRadio. And <laughs> we also have a bonus content platform called Drama Plus at patreon.com slash the drama podcast, where for $5 a month, you get extra episodes where Dylan and I talk about all things theater, pop culture, love, and life. We call them twin talks. They're really fun. And in addition to those extra episodes, you also get added to our Instagram close friends. And that's where the shit really goes down. It's juicy. It's fun. It's shady. It's cheeky. So everyone's got to go become a member of join the drama plus fam, download us and um, follow us everywhere. That's a lot of directives. So I hope, I know. I, I hope know. people aren't like thank overwhelmed. You, thank you guys so much for having us. This was such a seamless process too. I also want to say <laughs> we've had tons of, <laughs> I mean that earnestly. Other than um, my data issue. <laughs> yeah. Other than Connor, it was you, you guys have been wonderful and organized, but the, we have had quite a few smash cast members on drama over the years, Brian Darcy, James and Annalie Ashford, who are in this premiere alone. We mentioned it, but a lot of the season two cast members, Krista Rodriguez, Andy Mientis, it's Will well, Chase um, who plays Joe DiMaggio. Will, yeah. Will Chase who's comes up in season one. Um, we love talking about smash. And so this was extra special to revisit it with you guys. So we really appreciate it. Max, where can folks find you? Oh, you can catch me having a drink at the bar of heaven on earth at tonight's show. You can find me on all things social media (laughs) at Maxwell Singh. And you can find me trying to pick out the perfect audition song. Maybe something from Les Mis. Maybe that's too on the nose. But if you are looking for me on social media, you can find me at Run Jeff Run. If you are looking for the TV Pilots License, you can find us anywhere you listen to your podcast. You can also watch our smiling faces at TV Pilots License. If you have a question about the show or for our next episode, you can check us out at tvpilotslicense.com or shoot us a voicemail at 213-290-1713. Make sure to watch out for our Instagram for sneak previews of some of the stuff that we have coming up. But with the plane landed and the seatbelt sign off, we look forward to flying the bright skies of the TV world with you again soon. And until then, let me be your star. Hot dog, <laughs> Cracker Jack! <laughs> <laughs>